Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Wall, a Vice President and Senior Project Manager with Slayton Constructors, and I'm excited for this summit series today and the fantastic information we're going to hear. Now we will hear from Josh Baker, Tyler Resnick, and Jeff Hodson about tools for enhancing pre-construction and construction processes with lessons learned and case studies taken from the Lander Street Water Reclamation Facility Phase 1 Improvements Project. Whew, that's a mouthful. Josh is a project manager with the city and is currently leading the city's efforts on this project, which happens to be the largest water renewal upgrade project the city has undertaken in recent years. Tyler is a director of industrial construction with McIlvain Construction Companies and is McIlvain's project manager for the project. He leads the engineer, ah, sorry. Uh, he leads engineering team that is comprised uh, of Jacobs and Brown and Caldwell. At the end of their presentation, we will, find, we will field a few questions. So as they come up, please add them to the chat session. Take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next slide, please. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, my name is Josh Baker. I'm a uh, project manager for the city of Boise on the Lander Street phase one project. I wanted to start out with some project photos. Um, as many of you are also experiencing throughout the country right now, uh, 2020 has been a, a rather difficult time to do a construction project. It, it's been an ever shifting set of demands that we've put our team through. Um, and I think some of the lessons that we've learned in 2020 will be invaluable going forward. Um, I, I think that, you know, as, as we look to the future, we need to understand how as a construction community we can be more nimble uh, to be able to respond to these ever-changing demands and also uh, to, to echo what Cabria was saying earlier that we need to really be able to um, think about our workforce in a different way. Uh, they've been put under more stress this year than they ever have been before. And team has mattered more than it ever has before. And so well, that's kind of what we want to impart today. Next slide, please. So to give an idea of kind of an overview of what's going on in phase one, uh, Lander Street is one of two uh, wastewater facilities, water renewal facilities within the city of Boise system. It's the oldest. It was originally uh, commissioned by the League of Women Voters in 1948, was constructed in 1950 and online um, at its present location here. It's a very small site and in a very, uh, uh, you know, residential heavy area. Um, so it, it presented a lot of different demands uh, than most wastewater uh, construction sites that are often have more more space um, and, and have share different neighbors than residents. Um, the phase one project really began in 2015 when the city of Boise decided to keep Lander Street. There was a question whether that was going to happen. If not, if we were going to try and consolidate all of our wastewater at our West Boise water renewal facility. But in 2015, we did decide as a city we're going to keep Lander or we're going to retrofit it. And phase one is the beginning of basically a 20 year rebuild on this facility. Much of the much of the site is original to 1948. Um, and so it, it's going to need a lot of TLC coming up and, and phase one is really the kind of the beginning of that. And so what we did in phase one is we looked and said what are the facilities that we have the most risk on right now the city conducted a bunch of business case evaluations to understand what the risks were what the capital costs were and what we landed on was replacement of the headworks and the uv facility first and um, some pretty major site improvements um, that went on as well and so that is really what constitutes the phase one work it's a replacement a new uv facility and a new headworks facility next slide please So in 2017, we assembled the team. We decided to go as a city with a CMGC model. The design team selected was Jacobs and Brown and Caldwell were uh, teamed together on the selection. And then we had McIlvain Construction as the CMGC that we brought on board. And we started out with more of a traditional team atmosphere. So what I mean by that is even though we had a CMGC on board, um, we started out the relationship more like a design bid build where we had siloing going on between the design engineer and the contractor and the city. Um, and then 
slowly into 2018, we realized that that was going to become a bigger issue just because of the, the tightness of the site. Um, we wanted to leverage the CMGC model better. And so we began to change the way that we looked at the team. Next slide, please. So we, we sat down as a team and said, hey, how are we going to get through this in the next few years? And what we landed on is that we, we adopted this mentality of extreme ownership. It's a, it's a book produced uh, and written by Jocko Willink. And we adopted this idea, um, if one of us fails, we all fail. If we win, we all win. And so what this change in attitude for the team did is it brought together the engineer, the owner, and the contractor into the same mindset. And instead of pointing fingers when we we're faced with issues and problems, we decided, hey, it doesn't matter who caused this. It doesn't matter if it's a design omission or if it's a contractor quality control failure. We said, if it, it doesn't matter. If we fail, if one of us fails, we all fail. And so one of the guiding uh, things that we also did was completion of the project wasn't good enough uh, for us to be able to say that we were successful in the project. Uh, even coming in under budget and on schedule was not good enough. Uh, we, we decided to adopt this mentality that we, the only success above, uh, or the only way to gain success is to go above, you know, budget, on budget, on scope, on schedule. We also had to want to work together into the future. And that was an important mind shift uh, for our team to be able to understand that, that team relationship. And really what this comes down to is that when 2020 hit and the pandemic hit and everything else kind of started to fall apart, it was a very big blessing that we had decided to adopt this team mentality going into it um, because we were strained in ways that we couldn't even possibly imagine. And going into it with a traditional mindset, we would have spiraled out of control. Um, one of the things that we did is we developed our own team seal. And it's, it's shown there on the screen. And these are on all of the hard hats of the managers out on site. The idea behind this is that we kind of forsake the traditional, uh, the lines that are drawn between engineer, contractor, and owner, and, and sort of forsake the fact that we even work for those people anymore and that we focus on the team more. And I think this goes into to think about for future selections is that when you go into these large projects, you're really hiring people. You're not selecting the best firm necessarily. You're hiring the people to go forward and to be able to complete this project. And it's incredibly important to look at it that way because you're going to be working together for five, maybe 10 years in some instances. So really looking at it as more of a hiring process and as a team process is very important and one of the lessons we've learned. And now Tyler and Jeff will talk more about that later. Next slide, please. So the biggest lesson that we learned is to just to do lessons learned meetings. And so as a part of this new team atmosphere, what we did is we said, hey, we're going to have open and honest meetings every so often after major milestones. We're going to talk about the things we did good. We're going to talk about the things we did poorly and figure out ways to remedy those and to keep doing the things that we did. Some of the most important parts of this was check the ego at the door for our people. We are this team is comprised of many type A personalities. And so we really had to work on that to make sure that we weren't pointing fingers at the end and break down the kind of those traditional barriers. We had to have open and honest communication. And the biggest thing is that we had to have action items, actionable items that came out of every single meeting. What are we gonna do differently next? And how are we gonna move forward? It's always with the mindset to move forward and it's always with the mindset to look to what is in the best interest of the project. That's, that's the reason. And also for the meetings, we forced everybody to turn their phones and computers off so that we didn't get any dings or interruptions, uh, which did really help facilitate the meeting. Next slide. Now I'll turn it over to Tyler. Thank you, Josh. So we thought we would offer up a practical example um, of how we uh, implemented lessons learned on the Lander Street phase one project. Um, with our risk register. So this is something that we use weekly uh, and had been using weekly since 2017. And what we found is uh, looking at the old log um, up top is that we were actually getting lost in data. Uh, we spent more time 
discussing what these different categories meant than the actual risk item itself. Uh, as indicated by the top 15 risks in the upper left-hand corner, they're all pegged with each other. Um, and so what, what was uh, happening here is that there was no concept of, of probability or time associated with any one of these risk items. So we greatly simplified the risk register to measure what matters and uh, kind of set aside the things that don't. Uh, and applied probability to our risk items so that we could actually sort through uh, the immense amount of data and risk that was associated with the project. The other thing is that we, we started to um, uh, really look at, you know, which risks are coming up next by applying a time component to our risk and it, where before our, our risk register was completely silent on anything to do with time. Um, and so now in every single week, we, we focus on the ones that are coming up next with the, the greatest probability of happening. Next slide, please. So out of our lesson learned process, especially during pre-construction, one of the, the most important things that we stumbled upon is it seemed like we were spinning our wheels. Uh, we hadn't spent the time to, to pause and really identify uh, this decision-making process as part of pre-construction. And so it seemed like reoccurring themes kept showing up and decisions that we thought are, had already been made uh, actually weren't. And so we, we sort of hit a pause button and, and outlined uh, in much better detail, what does our decision-making process look like? You know, who are those decision makers? What are the limits of their authority? And when do we need to run things up the flagpole, so to speak, so that we can make, um, uh, an actual structure around our decision-making process. And as part of that, we really wanted to um, offer up solutions in a consistent manner so that the team all agreed and had an understanding of uh, which solution we picked and what it actually meant for the program. And so we came up with these four solutions of do nothing, uh, do the minimum, so like a minor rehab, do the maximum amount of work as a major rehab or just replace the asset because it's too far gone. Next slide, please. And so as part of every one of our uh, programming meetings and evaluations through the BCE process, we uh, started off the presentation with, you know, what is that decision that we are looking to make today? Uh, and listed off all of those decision options that are available to us. Uh, and then we always closed whatever meeting we were participating in with, okay, are we ready to make the decision today of the four options that were presented to us? And of that, we were able to, to strike a baseline of what the program actually was and record it on a tool that we called the decision log, uh, which captured who and when uh, people were making decisions, what that decision actually was. Uh, and as part of that, we were able to with our deliverables come up with um, a very consistent uh, baseline for the program at every step along the way. And so that there was no team members who were wondering what was in and what was out of the project scope. Uh, so as part of this though, we really wanted to keep some things that were on the cusp of being able to slip either in or out of the program with budget constraints uh, or schedule constraints. And so as part of the decision log, we always maintained a, an understanding of what, what are these different things that are right on the cusp that we could either toggle in or out of the program. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Hodson. Hi, good to be uh, with everyone today. Uh, I'm Jeff Hodson. I'm the project manager with Jacobs on this project. Uh, I lead the design team, which uh, includes both Jacobs and Brown and Caldwell. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about was our design review process. Um, certainly the, the CMGC delivery model uh, for this project really highlighted for us the fact that all team members bring valuable experience and insights to a construction project. And so we wanted to make sure that we kept the design process as open and inclusive as possible, that we didn't um, you know, go into a corner, so to speak, to, to design the project and come back with a, a complete set of construction documents. Um, but from the very beginning, we tried to involve everyone 
uh, in that review process, including city engineering staff, city operations staff, and the contractor staff, and, and other stakeholders as necessary. Our, our preliminary, our conceptual and preliminary engineering phases really um, were accomplished through a series of workshops um, that helped to get that entire team um, engaged and um, um, working on the project at the same time. Um, there were some challenges there because uh, with that many key stakeholders, some of those workshops got to be quite large. So one of the lessons that we learned was that we could use smaller meetings very effectively uh, for some topics by breaking out into smaller specific interest groups. We called these focus groups. Um, it helped us to stay on task better, um, but still gain in, input from all interested parties. Um, for example, we would, we would often get plant operators together for focus group discussions to discuss very specific and, and detailed uh, topics and decisions that needed to be made. Um, that may not have as, as broad impact or, or interest at, at other levels um, so that we didn't have to uh, bog down the entire team in a larger workshop with such discussions. And then those, those decisions and, and feedback would get um, rolled back up and, and discussed briefly in, in the larger workshops. Next slide, please. Um, as Tyler alluded to earlier, the decision-making process um, is, is really, well, the, the design process is really about making decisions. Um, so it's important to start with those broadest, farthest reaching decisions that need to be made, start with those big issues, and then throughout the design process, um, winnow down to all of the details um, that need to be on the final construction drawing set. Um, so with that, you have to make the, the decisions, the appropriate decisions at the right time, and then make those decisions at the appropriate levels. Um, and wherever possible, we tried to avoid revisiting decisions that we had made previously to keep moving forward in a, in a most um, efficient and effective manner. Um, since, since Josh talked about lessons learned, we wanted to bring up two lessons learned from the design review process. Um, one that was on the negative side and one that was on the positive side. So first on the negative side, um, we learned a lesson that it's, it's very critical and, and needed to debrief on all major comments. We had a, a comment that was made by the plant superintendent on, on one of the drawings during one of our formal design reviews um, during the design um, development. And the design lead engineer responsible for that drawing did not fully understand the comment um, and provided a response that it would be incorporated. But the, the rest of the team didn't understand that, that he didn't um, completely understand the comment. And so we went on our merry way. And luckily for us, the, the issue was caught during construction and was remedied, but it highlighted for us the fact that um, we need to have a debrief on all major comments and that every person that, that reviews um, a drawing set or specifications uh, should have the opportunity to list their, their most important comments and have the chance to debrief with them and um, discuss both the comment and the resolution so that we all understand as a team that, that we have a common consensus and understanding. One good lesson we learned was that 3D models are of great value to help the entire team um, envision the, the space and the systems that, were, that are being designed and will be constructed. We reduced the size of the Headworks facility in the early phases of the design process because of some budget constraints. Um, but then once we really got going with 3D models and were able to help um, the entire team visualize the space with those models, it became very apparent to the entire team that we had cut too much and that the operations and maintenance activities that would take place in the screen room were going to suffer because of that cut. And so we were able to um, find ways to increase the size of the, the Headworks facility to accommodate that. Next slide, please. Uh, so now we wanted to talk a little bit about the RFI process um, that we've been using 
on the Lander Street Phase One project. It has really evolved over time. Uh, the typical RFI process that a lot of us have seen involves multiple layers of a, song, a subcontractor developing a, a question, sending it to the general contractor who sends it on to the, the owner um, or design engineer or both. And then it comes back through the same process. The problem is, is that a lot of times the question is not well formed, uh, may not have enough information, may not have provided all the context. And when the response is given, it may not be complete. It may not even answer the question that was initially intended. Um, so if that happens, then you're left with a subcontractor out on site that's frustrated, that can't progress, um, and you just have to repeat the process again and again. So early in our construction phase, we decided that we were going to start using a spreadsheet um, that is shared with the entire team. Um, and that, do that document has evolved to track issues that come up on uh, the project. And we have basically used that in lieu of an uh, automated RFI process. It allows all the various sources on the project to um, access to the document both to provide questions or issues and also to assist in providing responses and solutions. We review the list each week, discussing new items that come up and also discussing the resolution. Um, the resolution to each issue gets discussed and agreed upon before it gets issued so that the entire team um, can stack hands and say, yep, we agree that's the right way to, go, to move forward. And Tyler, I know you had some other thoughts that you wanted to add here on this topic. Yeah, so one thing I wanted to state is that uh, this has afforded us the opportunity to continue to refine and optimize the, the project. We are still effectively val value engineering and doing our best to save time and money, um, whereas it would be very clunky if we were to go through this in, in an RFI process. Instead, this live document is really uh, helping us dial in the project as a whole. Thanks. Next slide, please. So the, the results of our modified process is really more talking about solutions, more discussions, um, in-depth conversations about those issues. Uh, we, we found that we get better questions um, and better answers and solutions out of this process because we are reviewing them as a team. Um, instead of just clicking buttons to pass paperwork back and forth. Um, one of the key uh, benefits that we've seen is that we're actually outpacing the subcontractors with their questions and answers. A lot of times you get subs that are out on, on the site waiting for answers, not being able to progress forward with their components of, of the construction um, because of those time de delays and needing to ask questions multiple times. And we've found that we are um, actually pushing solutions to them faster than, than they're able to ask questions in a lot of cases. Um, and then one of the greatest things is that we've seen that that value add um, has, has really arisen in net reductions to the construction cost because we've been able to provide or find as a team beneficial changes in scope. Um, to really reduce the, the cost of construction while still providing the, the same um, net results at the, at the end of the day. Um, Tyler, I think you were wanting to, to weigh in again on, on one thing on this slide as well. Yeah, it's just uh, maintaining this single source of truth for easy record keeping. I think it's really nice to have one place that we can go to. Um, to make sure that we always know what we've done and left those breadcrumbs in, in a way that isn't messy. So it's really been um, a, a, a process that's included a little bit more effort, but the results are much, um, much better than we've seen on other projects where the process is more automated. Um, I, we would point out, though, that we're still following contract terms in terms of when changes arise uh, from questions that come up on the on the log, uh, field orders, requests for proposal, change orders, and such are still being issued after the fact. Next slide, please. 
So one last um, area where we've decided to try to challenge the norms a little bit um, is about startup planning. Um, the, the startup process is really the most critical piece to any um, wastewater facility construction project. It's where things can really go wrong um, if you're not careful. So we wanted to do a better job at planning for that critical step and be more confident going in. Normally, the construction documents require that the contractor develop a startup plan. And we do that as engineers because the contractor knows the most about his schedule and the sequencing leading up to uh, um, the startup process. But the owner and the engineer also have a lot of information about the process, the constraints, and the operation at the plant that are critical to startup. Next slide, please. So we developed a, a process to collaboratively develop our startup plan during the first half of construction through a series of meetings. The, the design engineer is taking the lead on putting a lot of the information together, but with input review and collaboration from all the parties. Um, the expected results for this is really being able to have this plan developed and created well ahead of startup activities um, and including everybody on the team with this plan um, and we, since we can tailor it to our project, we, we end up with a plan that includes what we need, what we value as a team and excludes what doesn't help us. Um, and then finally, we, we hope to have a plan that uh, leaves every team member confident and excited about startup and reduce risks and um, that feeling of nervousness when it comes to uh, turning that first gate and, and starting starting the process flow into a new new facility. So I think with that, Jeff, we'll turn it back to you to see if there are any questions. Sounds great. Wow, what an amazing presentation. Uh, it looks like we have time for one question. So Tyler, uh, how did you manage and prioritize your risks when you streamlined your risk log? Yeah, so what we did is we, we scored every risk item that we identified uh, by category. So whether it's a, a schedule related risk or a budget related risk. Um, and then we assigned a probability of it actually occurring and times that total score by that probability score. And it became very obvious which ones rose to the surface and what our highest risks were to the project. But then we took it a step further and said, is this an immediate risk that we're facing like now, or is it a risk that is coming, you know, halfway through the project or even after the project is over? And so we grouped and sorted them by um, immediacy, but really paid attention to the probability. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, you can drop them in the chat room. It looks like we got about one minute left. Give it a couple seconds. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, Josh, Tyler, and Jeff for taking the time out of your busy schedules during these crazy times to not only develop, but present today. Uh, everybody stay tuned. The next session is start at 9.55 on the impacts of COVID-19 on construction. See you soon. <laughs>